On December 28, 1895, at the Grand Café in Paris, France, Auguste and Louise Lumière would screen their newest film, La Sautie de Lucienne Lumière à Horium, or Workers Living in Factory, among nine other of their films, to an audience of hundreds. What makes this wholly unique is that this would be the world's very first public screening. To project the films, an invention of the brothers known as the cinematograph was used. This projector also doubled as a camera, which the Lumieres would also shoot their very first movies on. It was hailed as revolutionary. In attendance, a young Georges Méliès was so astounded by the invention, he offered the brothers 10,000 francs, of which the Lumieres refused. However, it was a screening that would send shockwaves throughout the rest of the world. In just a few short years, their invention would reach dozens of countries, including the United States, where movie companies would use the technology to show their films to a now film-hungry audience. Thomas Edison would then open up Vitascope theaters, charging 10 cents a pop to come see one of the new marvelous One Real Wonders. By the time the early 1900s rolled around, movie theaters were fast becoming one of the most popular forms of entertainment around. Movies were indeed a lucrative business and had become quickly a staple in American life. By the 1920s, big movie studios started to replace the smaller ones. Fox, RKO, Paramount, Warner Brothers, and MGM, also known as the Big Five, all had a major stake in the American movie theater. Each studio owned and operated several of their own private theaters in which they would only screen films shot by each respective studio. However, an investigation by the Federal Trade Commission would reveal that the studios were illegally creating a de facto oligopoly. In 1948, the FTC ruled against the major movie studios in holding over 17% of all movie theaters in the US and broke them up and disallowed them from exclusively holding these chains and only showing their films. The major movie studios protested and worried that with this court case and the rising popularity of the very new sensation that was television, that they would lose millions of dollars of revenue. If they couldn't control the theaters, they argued, how could they actively compete with the magic box inside of your home that you can watch movies and shows on? To them, it was truly the beginning of the end. In a seismic shift for the film industry. Some of the biggest upcoming blockbusters. It is another blow for movie theaters already struggling. Warner Media says its studio will make its 2021 movies available. All of its upcoming movies from Dune and Wonder Woman 1984 to the new Tom and Jerry movie will be on HBO Max on the same day they hit theaters. In the context of a pandemic that has many of them at low volume or closed altogether, now Warner Brothers, uh, Warner says that it will uh, release all 2021 movies on HBO Max. On December 3rd, 2020, Warner Brothers Pictures, in partnership with HBO, announced, due to the global pandemic infecting the world, would be publishing all their new film releases slated for the 2021 year in movie theaters and adjacently to their streaming service HBO Max. Starting with Wonder Woman 1984, coming out on December 25th. AMC, America's largest current theater chain, was admittedly not happy. Said AMC CEO Adam Aaron, Clearly, Warner Media intends to sacrifice a considerable portion of the profitability of its movie studio division and that of its production partners and filmmakers to subsidize its HBO Max startup. As for AMC, we will do all in our power to ensure that Warner does not do so at our expense. We will aggressively pursue economic terms that preserve our business. For AMC and many other large and small theater chains, this new frontier of having top titles from the biggest studios in Hollywood right in our home right off the bat was horrifying. It was this time truly, truly the beginning of the end. Or was it? the outset of the year 2020, things looked prosperous. Bernie Sanders was leading in all major polling in the Democratic primaries. People were in mass at the gym trying to keep their New Year's resolutions tip-top, and Hollywood, for better or worse, was coming off one of their most lucrative years to date, 
with Avengers Endgame leading the pack, having earned the most coveted spot of highest grossing movie of all time. Not judging for inflation. <laughs> However, this was all mired by a very deadly disease with no active vaccine making its way around the world, known as COVID-19. <laughs> Americans, not thinking much of it as they do most things, had no idea that in just mere weeks, their world was going to be confined inside their homes, answering Zoom calls, and binge-watching a guy who actively owned tigers, arguing with a woman who also killed her husband, I mean, uh, <clears throat> owned tigers. The first week of March saw the first wave of stay-at-home orders and social distancing practices instituted. Movie theaters, among several other non-essential businesses, were forced to close down to help flatten the curve. A week before these orders took effect, Universal Studios, now the second most profitable Hollywood studio next to Disney, had released The Invisible Man. However, it wasn't in theaters long as COVID began rearing its ugly head on the movie business. On March 16th, 2020, Universal Studios announced that they would be premiering The Invisible Man and their other films slated, such as The Hunt and Trolls World Tour, on PVOD, or Premium Video On Demand. This was, in a sense, a historic move, and the first of its kind, where due to unprecedented circumstances, something as unprecedented as releasing films straight to video on demand due to the closure of theaters had to inevitably take place. And the result was very huge and very lucrative for Universal Pictures. What with Trolls World Tour grossing more than its predecessor, and that was on VOD. CEO of NBC Universal, Jeff Schell, went on record with the Wall Street Journal and said, The results of Trolls World Tour have exceeded our expectations and demonstrated the viability of PVOD. As a result of Universal Studios taking such drastic measures, said CEO of AMC Theaters, Adam Aaron, by the way, his name is going to be coming up a lot, it is disappointing to us, but Jeff's comments as to Universal's unilateral actions and intentions have left us with no choice. Therefore, effective immediately, AMC will no longer play any Universal movies in any of our theaters in the United States, Europe, or the Middle East. Despite Aaron's opposition and anger, other studios, such as Sony and Disney, quickly took note of how well the earlier films released by Universal had done with coming straight to video on demand. Sony would subsequently release the long-awaited film from comic book house Valiant in the Vin Diesel-led film Bloodshot, and on March 20th, Disney would release Pixar's Onward on VOD, and within a month, it was readily available on Disney+. Throughout the course of 2020, several studios would go on to release films directly to VOD, such as Disney's Mulan, which would show up on Disney Plus under a $30 paywall before getting on the regular service some three months later, and Bill and Ted Face the Music, a much-anticipated tentpole for the now-returning movie studio Orion. However, there were many holdouts, such as MGM pushing back their James Bond film No Time to Die, Sony pushing back Ghostbusters Afterlife, Disney pushing back Black Widow, and Warner Brothers pushing back Wonder Woman 1984. This was all in an effort to show these films at a movie theater, when of course movie theaters reopened to regular capacity once again. It was with Disney's Mulan that the tide began to shift. Reportedly, Mulan made close to $260 million on PVOD sales alone, although many argue the number is closer to $90 million in rental numbers. Even so, and even with the film getting mostly mixed reviews, this was still a financial success for Disney. Comparatively, the film that had been strictly released to theaters on the beset of its director Christopher Nolan, Tenet, only grossed $57.4 million in the North American box office. A summer tentpole release for Warner Brothers, this was lackluster at best after seeing over $250 million in the international box office. Tenant, as of this video, will stand to lose close to $200 million, or roughly half of what it cost to produce and market the film. Surely, there must have been a better way. <laughs> Movies at home and coming straight into your living room are not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. As early as 1906, there had been an effort by Thomas Edison and others to sell home projectors to individuals. They would rent out reels of their films to consumers. These films would be delivered by mail. Sound familiar? Of course, this was short-lived as not everyone had the means to project films themselves and even less had any type of screens to use. 
By the start of World War I, this process would be mostly defunct, and films would once again be relegated to only being seen once during their initial theatrical run. By the late 1940s, the popularity of television would bring new life to older films that hadn't been seen in years. At first, they saw TV as a fad, something that wouldn't last more than a few years. After its growing popularity, however, studios grew weary, fearing this new invention would lead to more people staying home and less people going out to see a movie. It is a challenge to cinema, the same way television in the early 1950s pulled people away from movie theaters and everybody stayed home because it was more fun to stay home and watch, you know, a comedy on television in the 1950s than it was to go out to see a movie. However, where some studios saw a threat, others, such as Universal and then MCA chairman Lou Wasserman, saw an opportunity to embrace the infant television and soon MCA had bought a portion of Universal's backlot to start making big budgeted television shows, becoming one of the first studios to now have a television division as well as continuing to make lucrative motion pictures. And by the 1990s, it was mostly commonplace for a movie studio to have a television division of their own. But television was just one of the many perceived demises of the movie theater notions over the many years. In 1975, another threat to the movie theater industry emerged with Betamax, the first home consumer video format, which was followed by VHS a mere year later. Movie theaters were hesitant about the new film format. Chess, the four-hour system from Panasonic and other leading companies. Not to mention, if people were to have access to movies at home, they might stop going to the movie theater. This was ill-founded. And by the 1980s, VHS proved to be the dominant forerunner of home media and movie studios were reaping more profits by making their films easier to buy and rent. It was during this period that rental houses, such as Blockbuster and Hollywood Video, would be the most profitable. Do you have any children's videos? Sure! Blockbuster's America's family video store. You know, we have more kids' videos than any place else. Blockbuster, in particular, would become the Starbucks of movie rental houses and it would eventually become the biggest in North America. It was very common throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s to see your favorite movie on the shelf mere months after you saw it in the movie theater. It was a glorious time. Three. There's one near you. Blockbuster Video. Wow, what a difference. But then... Then this mother had to come in and ruin everybody's good time. In early 1997, the DVD format was officially released upon the world. After seeing the portability and superior video quality of this very new DVD, Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph set out to create a business that combined the best parts of Blockbuster and eBay. My words, not theirs. By renting out movies by mailing DVDs through the mail. On August 29th, 1997, Netflix began with just 13 employees and just under a thousand DVD titles to be rented out. While the business initially started out slow, they would pick up steam in the years to come. This wasn't without rot. They reported a loss of $57 million in the year 2000 alone and were quickly propositioned to be bought out by, who else, Blockbuster Video. The offer was declined and the DVD by mail rental company continued to push through. By 2002, they opened a public IPO in the stock market, taking Netflix public. Business and the future of Netflix looked good. Even Blockbuster tried their hands at mail and DVDs, but we all know the end of that story. It was on February 14th, 2005 that things really took a turn. A young website known as YouTube was launched and introduced to the world. A video streaming website where anyone could create a free account and upload silly cat videos, and basically anything they wanted to, was going to revolutionize the way we watch content at home. This was not lost on the people at Netflix, and just a mere two years later, Netflix began to offer the first streaming service amid a selection of films from their very own website. By 2011, Netflix would produce its first show, House of Cards, starring Kevin Spacey, to its growing streaming library, and by 2015, would release its first feature film, Beasts of No Nation, starring Idris Elba. From its popularity, Amazon, Hulu, and many other copycats would get into the streaming business. Blockbuster and the days of video rental houses were gone. By 2014, Blockbuster had shuttered its doors and Netflix was on its way to being the dominant force in how we consume content. 
Since the growth and popularity of streaming services, filmmakers such as Steven Spielberg and Christopher Nolan have lashed out against Netflix, Hulu, and the others, said Steven Spielberg. So Hollywood's used to that. We are accustomed to be, being highly competitive with television. That a lot of studios would rather just make a branded, tentpole, you know, guaranteed box office hits than take chances on smaller films. And those smaller films the studios used to make routinely are now going to Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix. Television is really thriving with quality and art, but it is poses a clear and present danger to film goers. So you are concerned about, you know... I am. Yeah. But I'll, st I'll still make the post for audiences asking them please to go out to the movies to see the post and not make it directly mm -hmm. for Netflix. Said Christopher Nolan on Netflix. I think the investment that Netflix is putting into interesting filmmakers and interesting projects would be more admirable if it weren't being used as some kind of bizarre leverage against shutting down theaters. It's so pointless, I really don't get it. Well, it's very interesting if you look back at the, the history. Um, as soon as TV comes along in the 1950s, people start saying movies are dead, TV's taking over. Um, it's been that way, you know, for generations at this point. Um, I think they're just different, and there are all kinds of wonderful things about TV, but it can't take the place of movies. The communal experience of sitting and watching a, a two hour story unfold uh, with an audience around you, I think that's a, a very important part of our cultural life, and I, I think it always will be. On September 18, 2017, Martin Scorsese, quite arguably the greatest living modern filmmaker of the last 40 years, started production on a Netflix original movie, The Irishman, a spiritual culmination of the gangster films that he's been famous for. It was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Director and Best Picture, and it was released on Netflix. Having released their streaming service HBO Max earlier on in 2020, Warner Media and HBO expected big numbers. Unfortunately, HBO Max did not generate the kind of attention and new subscribers as they previously had hoped for. To top this off, Warner Brothers had another fish to fry. Director Christopher Nolan was insistent that his multi-million dollar action blockbuster Tenant be released as scheduled and not get pushed back as Wonder Woman, another Warner Brothers title, had been. In an op-ed to Congress, Nolan wrote, When this crisis passes, the need for collective human engagement, the need to live and love and laugh and cry together, will be more powerful than ever. The combination of, of that pent-up demand and the promise of new movies could boost local economies and contribute billions to our national economy. We don't just owe it to the 150,000 workers of this great American industry to include them in those we help, we owe it to ourselves. We need what movies can offer us. However, despite him being adamant that people go to the movies during the summer and watch his film on the big screen as he intended, people, especially in the States, decided to mostly stay home. Stay home and watch other straight-to-video releases such as Scoob, which generated more in VOD sales than what Tenet did at the US box office. Not to mention, the cries by Nolan for people to do something unsafe and go to a movie in mass. Good job, Chris. Enter Ann Sarnoff, head of Warner Media Studios. Seeing the failure of Tenant at the box office during a pandemic, but the success of other studios' films on VODs and Warner Brothers' Scoob, and noticing the fledgling HBO Max, which falls under Warner Media, there arose an idea. On November 19th, 2020, Warner Brothers announced that Wonder Woman 1984, a movie that was supposed to be one of the biggest releases of the year, was headed straight to HBO Max. This worried some and excited others. For the first time this year, a major release was coming to a streaming service directly without going to PVOD first. Of course, it will also be released in theaters, whatever theaters that are going to be open that is. And a few weeks later, on December 3rd, it was subsequently announced that all 17 of Warner Brothers' major releases, slated for 2021, would now be released on HBO Max on the same day as their theatrical releases. And like clockwork, 
On December 7th, 2020, Christopher Nolan issued a statement that this was a bad business decision by Warner Brothers and that HBO Max was the worst streaming service. When in actuality, this was probably the best business decision. In a March 9th, 2020 article on Zipia, they reported that Netflix was making about $950 million a month, or around $11 billion per year and about 167 million subscribers worldwide. On October 22nd, Variety had reported that HBO Max hit 28.7 million subscribers. While it's not the exact number of Netflix's subscriber count, one could argue that with the announcement of all their films coming to HBO Max, and with a subscription starting at $14.99, if they were to shoot up their subscriber count to at least 100 million, they could see a revenue of upwards of $1.5 billion a month. Those aren't cheap numbers. That could literally fund Wonder Woman three times over. So yes, Christopher Nolan, this is actually a very good business decision on the part of Warner Brothers Media. I think it's quite telling that instead of telling people, hey, you know what, stay safe, stay home, Christopher Nolan would sacrifice people's safety in order to keep his creative integrity. And scrolling through Facebook comments and Twitter comments and Instagram comments and comments from Mars. It's been quite exhausting. Many people are excited about the prospect of having these big movies coming to their houses right away as well as movie theaters, because not everybody's going to be able to go to a movie theater, especially right now during a pandemic. Others are scared that this is going to be the death of the movie industry. And I can't blame them for thinking that because every time something new or important happens in the film industry, the movie studios and the movie theater houses get scared. Just like how TV was going to be the death of the movie industry or VHS tapes or Netflix. Now, was it the death of Blockbuster? Unfortunately, yes, it was definitely the death of video rental houses. There are still video rental houses, mom and pop ones, albeit, in the US. They're not as many as there was 10, 20, 35 years ago, but they still do exist. And I personally don't think movie theaters are gonna go away anytime soon. So what I'm saying is that there's still a want for movie theaters. There is still a demand for movie theaters. With Warner Brothers' announcement, what will the other movie studios do? Now, granted, this can change day to day. Tomorrow, Sony could have announced they're going to be releasing all their titles on video on demand. Uh, Disney or Paramount or any of the other big movie studios could just as well say, hey, we're going to be releasing our movies straight on video on demand as well as movie theaters the same day. And the other unknown variable is, is this going to be a permanent fixture in the movie industry? Or is this just temporary until there's a vaccine for COVID-19? <laughs> we don't know. But I do know that if this does become a permanent fixture, it's because it was profitable. As of this writing, HBO Max only has a small fraction of the subscribers that Netflix does. However, with the release of Wonder Woman and now the release of all of their movies, they could see that subscriber number shoot up considerably. And if it shoots up considerably, they could possibly be making the budget of all of their films a month. So I don't think that the answers are as straightforward as we'd like to believe. Like I said before, I just don't think that movie theaters are going to disappear. There's a certain magic that goes with going to a movie theater and enjoying a film with everybody in the theater. When I went to go see a, the first Avengers movie, I had a great time, just as I had when I saw the last Avengers movie. I had a, And those great times are then compounded with all the amazing great times I've ever had at a cinema, from as far back as when I can remember going to see Batman 1989 on the big screen, to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, to Jurassic Park, 
just the, the movies that defined my childhood, and then the movies that defined my adulthood, like The Dark Knight, and There Will Be Blood, and Glorious Bastards, and The Artist, and just so many other fantastic movies that I've watched on my time on Earth. I just don't have those same memories from watching movies at home the way I had watching movies at a movie theater. A couple of years ago, I got to see The Godfather on the big screen for the first time at the New Beverly Cinema in Hollywood. And for those of you out there that don't know about the New Beverly Cinema, it's a movie theater owned by Quentin Tarantino where he gets to show whatever the hell he wants to show or whatever his staff wants to show on 35mm prints. And I got to see The Godfather on the big screen in 35mm at the New Beverly Cinema and the best part about that experience was that not only was it a full house and everybody was enjoying the movie along with me, but in attendance was Quentin Tarantino himself. That was really memorable because he was such a nice guy to everybody approaching him and coming up to him shaking his hand and him just talking about the Godfather with all of us. And I think that's the camaraderie that movie theaters still offer. And I just don't think that this move is going to change that. What is going to happen is that the movie theater industry in particular is going to have to evolve and change. And that's fine because they've been evolving and changing for the last 120 years. So this is not going to be something that is going to be the death of cinema. But it is going to be the gradual next step into what happens to us and the content we consume and the way that movie studios in particular release films to us. And it is ignorant for a company like AMC Theaters to think that Warner Brothers or Universal or Disney are just going to sit on these titles that have already been made. Millions of dollars that have been poured into these movies are just going to sit on the shelf until a vaccine for COVID has magically appeared. We don't know when that happens. And by the time you see this video, we might actually have a vaccine, depending if you see this video in 2022. I don't know. But are these movie studios going to sit on their product forever just to wait for that to happen? I don't think that's a realistic thing to, to expect out of movie theaters. I, I just don't. And I especially don't think that releasing things to movie theaters exclusively right now in this climate is a good business practice either. Look at Tenet. Tenet from Christopher Nolan was supposed to make millions and upon hundreds of millions of dollars for Warner Brothers. That didn't happen. And they lost a chunk of money because of that. Because Christopher Nolan just had to make sure that this did not go on video on demand. It had. It just had to be shown in theaters first. You can't do that. Not in this climate. This is not last year. This is not five years ago. This is 2020. A really screwy, crazy year. That's just the reality of the world we live in right now. And I think this is a good business decision by Warner Brothers and if any other movie studios decide to follow suit as well. But of course, that's just one nerd's opinion. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, please like... You know what? Just do what every other YouTuber says. I don't think I have to remind you. Anyways, thanks for watching. This is Geektoid, and until next time, live long and geek on.